dear friends in Christ, our sermon title is Is There No Justice? And based on the reading from our Old Testament, chapter 53, verses 8. There are many forms of injustice in our world today. Here is one example closer to home. I received an email message from Chris Viner Roger, the president of CEO of Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Services on Monday. Here is what Chris says. Dear Reverend Lou, what I witnessed at the border was heart-wrenching. I was devastated by the number of women desperately seeking to meet the basic needs of their young children, including diapers, food, and medical care. As a mother of a one-year-old, I could only imagine the life-changing decisions that forced them to leave their homes and make the dangerous journey to America. And I was brought to tears when I said to the mother that I was younger than her daughter when my mother and father fled a civil war and brought me to the United States. I encouraged them not to give up hope because the America so many of us know is a better, more welcoming place than the one they have experienced so far. I also assure them there are many Americans willing to help. Chris also says that she went to the border to commemorate the one-year anniversary of the administration zero tolerance policy and afterwards wrote this letter. With your help, we will continue to fight against inhuman policies while delivering shelters and essentials to the children and families in our care. And then she ended here and said, thank you for your generosity for Lutheran Immigration Refugee Service relief efforts in recent days. As the need grows, we need your urgent support and prayers to help us meet the challenge ahead. Sincerely, Chris. Maybe some of you also have received this email message from Chris who works for Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Services. Lutheran Immigration Refugee Services is doing their best to fight against inhuman policies and injustice policies. I remember 40 years ago, I was one of the recipients of the work and service of Lutheran Immigration Social Service. Because of their work and service, 
they were able to find a Lutheran church in the East Coast to sponsor me from the refugee camp. I was one of those refugees who fled from Vietnam. I wonder why I was one of the lucky ones to make it through the refugees came to the United States, while many others couldn't make it. Without the grace and mercy of God and the service and work of the Lutheran Immigration Refuge Services, I wouldn't be standing here this morning. Is there no justice in the world? How often have we said that? We hear stories and stories of criminals who obviously are guilty but get off on some technicality and go free only to injure more victims. So often the innocent suffers because of the apathies of our society. The tragic epitome of that evil consists in the millions of innocent babies who have been and continue to be aborted like silent lambs led to the slaughter. The infants are unable to open their mouths to speak, and so few others open their mouths that we condemn them to the slaughter by our own silence. In large cities, victims of crime may scream for help, but their cries are ignored by those who do not want to become involved. The difference between rich and poor grows every year. In the business world, those who bend the rules and step on those beneath them often do come out on top. Nice guys, may finish last. Is there no justice? Why doesn't God do something? Why doesn't God come down from heaven and punish the wicked? Why doesn't God carry out justice? Some people go so far as to say there must not be a God or God must not be good or God must not care about us. Others propose that God is an impotent God, not powerful enough to stop evil. If we are honest with ourselves, we must admit that we may be part of the problem of injustice rather than the solution. We may be the ones who go unpunished when we speed on the highway or fudge on our taxes. We turn a deaf ear to others who are in need of help, ask for our help. We may be the ones who step on others as we rush to climb to the top of the ladder. If, if God would completely eliminate injustice, we would have to go. 
But God wants everyone to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. So for now, God continues to let the world let the world go on, postponing, postponing the day of judgment so that more people can be brought to faith in Christ Jesus. For now, God tolerates humanity's injustice and grants time for us to turn from our unjust ways. Judgment day will come. Then injustice will be no more. Each person will be either in heaven, daily worshiping the Lord, or in hell with an unquenchable, facing unquenchable fire. Yet, God has not said silently, by the world has suffered injustice ever since Cain murdered Abel and seemed to get away with it. God has in fact done something, something so amazing, something so wonderful. God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to suffer the greatest injustice the world has ever seen. Yet, paradoxically, God is a God who, through injustice, justifies the ungodly. Jesus never rebelled nor deviated from his father's plan. He committed no violence, nor did any deceive even come from his mouth. Jesus humbled himself as the silent lamb of God, led to the slaughter he was spotless, without sin or blemish of any kind. Yet, Jesus was taken away by oppression and without justice. As Jesus prost, prost, prostrated himself in Gethsemane, a riotous mob came with swords and clubs to arrest him. He had never used force to threaten anyone to accompany him. But now, the rubble bound and forced him to come with him. Jesus could have blown them all away with a sword, but he told Peter to put his shows away. Jesus surrendered without a fight in order to fulfill Isaiah's prophecies in our text. Our Lord was deprived of justice. He was denied due process of law. He endured hurry makeshift trials before the high priest and the Jewish council, before Pilate, before Herod, and then back to Pilate according to ancient Jewish law. These trials were unjust for many reasons. Jesus was tried at night before the Passover and in a private home instead of a court of a court of law. 
And the verdict was which prematurely. Even the false testimony of the false witnesses against Jesus did not agree. Pilate and Herod together acquitted Jesus a total of five times. The unjust trials of Jesus were an observed and a miscarriage of justice. Yet, the greatest injustice was this. The innocent one volunteer, voluntarily suffered for the sin of us and all humanity. He was stricken because of our transgression. He suffered a due penalty for all the injustice we have ever done. He was pierced for our transgression and crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brings us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. The Lord laid on him the sin of us all. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for our sake, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. In this way, God carried out his own forms of justice, the objective justification of sinful humanity. What does objective justification mean? There are two aspects of justification theologically. Objective justification is God's verdict of not guilty upon the world for the sake of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. Subjective justification means that the benefits of God's verdict of not guilty becomes yours and mine through faith in Christ. So, the wages of sin is death. But in God's economy of grace, it was Jesus who endured the death in our place. He was cut off from the land of the living so that we may have everlasting life in his name. His condemnation is our pardon. His judgment is our forgiveness. Jesus was taken away by oppression and without justice. Who would have considered his descendants? At the time of Christ's death, perhaps no one imagined that he would have any future or any future followers. Jesus' enemies thought that he would be quickly forgotten, that his disciples would despair. Who would want to risk suffering the same kind of unjust fate as Jesus did? Thanks to be God, Christ rose from the dead. His disciples rejoiced and spread the word. Pentecost came, and on one day, 3,000 were baptized into Christ, 
and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the communion of those baptized into Christ's death and resurrection has grown astonishingly ever since. Today, Christ has millions of descendants, those who are begotten by water and the Spirit, given new life by the Word and sacraments. Only God knows the full numbers who would have believed that this would happen? So, now when we confront injustice, we do not despair. God has done something about it. We take refuge in the equity of God's justice that condemned the innocent Christ for all our sins, so that we might be justified, declare righteousness, and be his descendants, heirs of eternal life. What gracious justice! Amen. May the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, May keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.